you know, I had a, a conversation with someone recently who told me, and this, I'm afraid, is a direct quote, that he was worried that if Donald Trump is elected president, that he would bring back slavery. Honest to goodness, like chains, indentured servitude, slavery. Now, in the American political tradition, we're all prone to hyperbole. You know, we say what we say to get our side elected, to advocate for our causes and rally behind whatever issues going on. But it seems like this particular political season, and particularly uh, the, the contra Trump side of things, have just absolutely taken things to an entirely different level of absurd. Now, before we go any further, I don't vote. I do not participate in the American political process whatsoever. You know, I'm not a Trump supporter, not a Sanders supporter, not voting for Hillary Clinton, not voting for Ted Cruz, not voting for any third party candidates. I am not a voter. I believe voting is wrong and immoral and incomprehensible and I, just a really stupid thing because the fact of the matter is you should never ever let anyone uh, speak on behalf of your interests. Electing some guy who makes a million dollars a year to go up in Washington and basically rally behind the things that mean a lot to you is utter nonsense. It's complete absurdity. And uh, the thing is about politics, every you know two years, people buy into it. They get suckered into it. They keep thinking, you know, if they elect their God figure, you know, their chosen politician, things will get better. All of the anger and hostility and resentment that they've collected over the last two years, they all put it in their effigy. You know, their exalted figure, their Sanders, their Trump, their Clinton, their Cruz, whatever. That if this guy wins, if this guy wins, he's going to, you know, make everything all right. He's going to validate us. And, you know, that's more or less kind of been the way politics have worked for quite some time. But this year, I'm seeing something that I've never encountered in my lifetime. And that's that it's not just you're rooting for your guy as much as it is you're rooting for the absolute destruction of the other side. Now, politics, they've always been contentious. You know, the Romney-Obama thing was pretty hard fought. Uh, you know, Kerry versus Bush, you know, that was definitely uh, not a cakewalk. But this year, when you look at it, the Trump versus Sanders dynamic, I mean, it's absolutely like, almost like riot fodder. Like if you put like 500 Sanders supporters against 500 Trump supporters and lock them in a room, there would be fatalities. Like they would literally kill each other. And that's something that's absolutely, to me at least in my lifetime, so anathemic to the way the U.S. works, that I just can't help but just stand back and look at this animosity and all of this political fury and, you know, not be really concerned. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to focus on Trump. You know, I'll probably do one about the anti-Sanders, anti-Clinton movement a little bit later on. But I'm doing this one because just from an objective viewpoint, what we're seeing happen from non-Trump supporters against Trump supporters I think is a whole lot more visual. First off, the media, clear as day, hates Donald Trump. Uh, left and right do not want him elected, and they're doing everything in their power to just slander him. Uh, every time you go to a Trump rally, they've got guys out there with cameras, uh, people that are you know, anti-Trump supporters, well, I guess they're not really Trump supporters, they're just Trump detractors. They got their cell phones going out there just praying, hoping that they can watch you know, some old white dude punch a black guy, and they can run with that and put it on, you know, their front page and say, look, oh, look, you know, white supremacy running wild like Hulkamania at these Trump rallies. And you're seeing with the Huffington Post and the Atlantic and Salon and Slate and all these other, you know, uh, completely, you know, biased outlets that are just running hit piece after hit piece day in, day out. Trump's a racist, his supporters are racist, even, you know, organizations like the New York Times who, ironically enough, you know, is actually owned by uh, the richest businessman in Mexico. He's the majority shareholder, Carlos Slim. Not a lot of people know that. That's something that I just found out recently. And all of a sudden, that kind of makes the whole anti-Trump thing <laughs> a little bit more sensical, you know, to have the world's uh, 
or at least the country's most popular and respected journalistic entity, you know, definitely going out there and just trying to decimate Trump on a daily basis. You know, the guy that's against NAFTA, the guy who's trying to bring back immigration, the guy who's trying to, you know, bring back American manufacturing, that that publication is actually owned by, you know, the wealthiest uh, Mexican businessman. All, all of a sudden, it takes on an entirely different dimension. But that's neither here nor there. But you have them running stories, you know, like I've, I read one recently where the entire article was just this absurd, absurd feature story about how to speak to your children about Trump. They had like kids worrying that, you know, all the Mexicans would be deported, even the ones that came here illegally. Uh, there are people afraid that all their Muslim friends would be, you know, rounded up and, and put in gas chambers. All of this absolutely just fundamentally absurd things that are just going far beyond Godwin's law to the point of just insanity. The kind of things you're hearing about Trump, what he's going to do. He's like Chuck Norris in reverse. He's going to do nothing but like become Genghis Khan and, you know, eat babies and, and take away women's rights to vote. It's all this fundamentally just unrealistic things. And of course, because he's the, the political other, you can say whatever you want. There's nothing you can say about Trump. Compare him to Hitler, Mussolini, you know, compare him to Satan, uh, compare him to Tom Brady, whatever your standard for evil is. That's who Tom, uh, not Tom Brady, sorry. That's who Donald Trump is. And you're just seeing all this stuff, you know, and the thing is, it's not just people going after Trump. That That's one thing. It's the fact that they're going after the Trump supporters, just endlessly accusing them of being racist and misogynist, you know, and anti-Hispanic and anti Muslim, just anti everything, but you're just being bombarded by that narrative day in, day out. You put it on CNN, Fox News, read the New York Times. What do you see? Trump supporters, bunch of violent hicks, you know, toothless white guys, you know, wife beaters, you know, that uh, want to bring back Jim Crow. You're just seeing that over and over again. And the thing is, I'm one of those guys where I don't just take people's word for it. You know, if somebody's saying something's happening, I have to go out and see it for myself. And a couple of weeks ago, I actually did go to a Donald Trump rally. I went to a Bernie Sanders rally, too, and I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And I went there, and I didn't see all of the insanity that you're hearing about. You know, I didn't see any black people getting beat up. I didn't see people, you know, unfurling swastikas. I didn't hear racial slurs whatsoever. In fact, I actually saw quite a few African-American people who were supporting Trump. Uh, a lot of Asians. Uh, not a whole lot of Hispanics and Muslims, but I guess it kind of makes sense. But you're seeing these people, and you talk to them, and you, you break them apart from the crowd, because I do that, because I'm, I'm interested in seeing why people believe in these things, why they have their uh, sociological perspective that they do. And you sit down and you talk to them, and you realize the Trump supporters, even though the media kind of comes at you and says, okay, well, clearly they're racist, you know, they're a bunch of white nationalists, they, you know, want to, they're anti-globalization, all this stuff you're hearing, you know, that that's one way to run with it, but just from what I saw when I was talking to people, you know, that wasn't their catalyst. They told me that's not the reason why they're voting for Trump. They're not voting because, you know, he's anti-whatever. They're saying it's like, you know what, you know, it's hard times economically. You know, we can't afford health care. Our businesses are being taxed. You know, we're afraid we're going to lose our jobs. In Mexico, there's no manufacturing industry in America. Uh, you know, there's all these cuts to the military. Our benefits are not coming. You know, all these very reasonable things. These things have nothing to do with the fact that we're a bunch of, you know, slobbering maniacs that, that hate everybody. And the fact of the matter is, you go out and you talk to a Trump supporter, I can guarantee you the reason they're voting for him is the reason why anyone really votes for any candidate. They're just advocating their own economic interests. They look at Trump and they're like, okay, you're going to cut back taxes. Like part of his plan, what is it? If you make less than 25000 a year, you have no federal tax liability whatsoever. If you're a uh, married couple and you make less than 50000 a year, you have no federal liability. That has a lot of appeal to people. That's something that, you know, if you're on the lower end of the spectrum, that's going to save you a lot. That's going to keep you really out of the lower class. It's going to keep you from falling below the poverty line. Uh, bringing back manufacturing, you know, cutting the corporate tax rate, all of these things. And even the whole part about the illegal immigrants, because what's happening? You know, that's the whole point why you have so much animosity 
and you know these, these uh, former industrial pockets you have so few jobs as is and you're forcing you know lower class whites and lower class blacks and lower class Hispanics to basically fight each other over you know scant jobs and scant public resources and scant housing what do you expect is going to happen of course they're going to have you know uh you know these rivalries there's going to be this animosity but it has nothing to do with you know some sort of you know long-held historical you know bigotry it's the fact that they're having to economically compete and of course when you do that you want to feed your family you want to feed yourself you want to take care of your own business of course you're going to see these things flare up and trump more so than any other candidate especially in this cycle he's a guy that's you know advocating for that that what we used to call the american school of economics which was very protectionistic right where you have the tariffs where you know you're not letting foreign products into the country you know unless you know they're paying you know the same rates we're paying us for get our products over there and that was something that kind of went out with uh, the nixon administration and if you look at it you know you see manufacturing wealth the window with nafta you got tpp coming up you have all these things which basically means okay manufacturing less and less of it and you know what happens you know we're seeing that now with software jobs you know we heard about disney where you have you know all the guys who are doing it work you know they're being replaced by guys you know on you know limited visas there are stories about them being forced to actually you know train the guys that are replacing them for lower wages and we all heard about carrier where you had all those guys lined up and you know like a thousand jobs are being spread to mexico i mean this is a palpable threat these are these people's livelihood you know, 60, what, 62% of the country doesn't have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And these people, they're not going into, you know, IT. They're not going into nonprofit management. They're not going into health care. They're blue-collar workers, white, black, and Hispanic. You know, they want to work in factory jobs. And, you know, they can't all work at McDonald's. They can't all work at Burger King and support a family. And that's what they're doing. That's why they're flocking to Trump. Nothing about being members of the Klan not you know because they don't like black lives matter it's because they have economic concerns and trump meets them not saying it's right not saying it's wrong but to them it makes sense i think objectively there's no other way to look at it but then you look at the people who are anti-trump you know mostly sanders supporters and the thing that they're doing where it's not just you know we don't like your candidate it's we're actually going to actively try to derail his campaign we're going to you know show up at you know um, uh, his uh, his rallies we're going to have these coordinated attacks where we try to rush the stage at the same time like we saw in Chicago we're going to do what they did in Arizona where they're going out there and they're actually blocking public infrastructure to keep people from going people actually you know signed out a ticket who are there to actually see the guy in person they're doing that which is just downright McCarthyist tactics and you know we're seeing it even with anonymous you know these people who are actually cyber criminals who are going out and publishing his information who are doxing him who are saying okay we're going to reveal his information we're going to steal public you know private information and post it and now we're getting to the point where you have guys going there you know directly antagonizing people with the hopes of getting hit that's what they want you know they want to go out there and they want to get some guy really riled up so they get punched they want bloodshed they want to be seen as the victims when in fact really it's the Sanders supporters who are the antagonists I mean I'm not saying that to be political I'm not trying to you know divide anyone but it's the truth you don't see Trump supporters disrupting Hillary Clinton rallies you don't see Trump supporters stand in the middle of the highway to keep them from going to Sanders rallies it just doesn't happen why because for whatever reason they don't feel the need they don't believe that uh, you know they should be out there keeping people from going to support who they want to support which is something you're not seeing on the Sanders slash Clinton side of things and that's something that really concerns me because that's so anathemic to the American tradition you know we have this thing called the First Amendment which says you have the right to peacefully assemble in public property and the Trump things, just so you know, those are all private functions. So a lot of the First Amendment things don't actually apply to there. You can throw out whoever he wants. But the fact of the matter that you're using, like, physical force, that you're standing in the road to keep people from going to attend something, that, you know, that they're paying money to see, that they're consciously choosing for themselves, just because you don't like it. Sorry, folks, there's no other way around. That's terrorism. That is ideological terrorism 
plain and simple. Uh, basically, you don't like what someone says, so you physically stop them from saying it. Folks, that's McCarthyism. That's nothing but just straight up anti-First Amendment nonsense. And like I said, you know, we're not seeing that on the Trump side. You don't have the guys trying to stop him from going to Sanders rallies. You're only seeing it from one side of the fence. You're seeing it from a news media who's constantly bombarding you with the idea that Trump supporters and Trump himself are just racist and their opinions are invalid and there's no economic concerns for it. And you're having these things where you're promoting the guys who crash Trump rallies, you know, as some sort of like, you know, heroes. But if someone protested, you know, Hillary Clinton and jumped the stage, you know, screaming about anti-globalization, they'd be written off as kooks. You know, they would be uh, jailed. You know, they'd be considered, you know, terrorists or hate criminals. All these things. It's a completely just despicable, one-sided, non-discussion going on. And I'm sorry, that's not America. Even if you don't like Trump, even if you think he's going to do all these horrible things, which, quite frankly, you can't because you got to have money, you have to have support from Congress, you have to have support from the public, and this stuff's not going to fly. Even if you don't like that, you do not have a fundamental right to stop others from listening to something you don't. And if you do, if that's something you believe you should, if you believe Trump's message is so despicable that no one should hear it, if you believe you have the right to physically force people from hearing it, Sorry, you're a fascist. You're 20 times worse than Donald Trump ever is. Because you know what? In America, you're allowed to say pretty much whatever you feel. Whatever you believe is true. You're allowed to say it. And no one, especially not some, you know, political dissident, has the right to come along and tell you you can't say it. Or physically force you or confront you or use threats of violence to keep you from saying something unpopular. And ultimately, that's what this whole Trump thing is showing us. You know, the freedom of speech, the First Amendment, the right to free expression, was never, ever designed to protect popular speech. Why? Because it's popular. It doesn't need protecting. The whole point of having the First Amendment, the whole point of having free expression and free speech and free press and all that stuff is to protect people who say things that are controversial. Things that perhaps the government doesn't like. But as we've noticed over the years, there is a huge fundamental flaw in that. And that is that for whatever reason, the First Amendment, our right to free expression, does not protect us from the tyranny of the public. You know, if the public wants to censor you, there's really nothing in the Constitution that stops that. Unless, of course, it is a criminal. If it becomes them, you know, assaulting you, or, uh, you know, trespassing, or, you know, stepping on public property, preventing, impeding the flow of traffic, or cyber attacks, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing it cross over from this being a political debate to being, you know, physical force. We're going to fight you. We're going to leak your information online. We're going to say you're a member of the Klan with no proof. We're going to do all of this underhanded, you know, downright McCarthyist tactics just because we don't like your candidate. We don't believe you have the right to say what you want to say. And quite frankly, we don't care about anyone's opinion but our own. And that's it. And you know, no matter if you, you like Trump, personally, I don't really care for him. You know, I'm not a fan. Like I said, I'm not voting for anybody. But even if you absolutely hate his guts, if you're a diet in the wool Democrat, as long as you profess a reverence for the First Amendment, and like I said, there's not a whole lot of things I believe in, the First Amendment is one of them. Even if you're just remotely, objectively a supporter of the First Amendment, you have to look at what's going on uh, with the way the media is slamming Trump, with the way protesters are attacking him, with the way his supporters are being just absolutely villainized and slandered, and seeing all these protests where people are physically being kept from actually hearing something they support, there's no way you cannot look at that and not say, you know what, they're trying to take away our First Amendment rights. This is the public tyranny. This is the tyranny of the masses. This is ideological terrorism. And, uh, you know, like I said, love them, hate them, whatever you feel about Trump. This affects all of us. Because at the end of the day, you know, if people are allowed to go out there and shut down roads and, you know, invade private events and slander people and keep them from silent, uh, keep them from voicing themselves out of fear of being called names and, you know, having these wild, unfounded allegations thrown upon them, 
then guess what? That means a good five years down the line, when the shoe goes underfoot, the same thing happens to you. If you don't defend your enemies' right, your political others' right to free expression, guess what? You don't have free expression yourself. So uh, just before we go any longer with this whole uh, political uh, nonsense, just keep that in mind. You know, your political other, your political opponent has the very same fundamental rights that you do. And at the end of the day, there's nothing more fascist to believe in than you and you alone and your like-minded brethren and people like you. And only people like you deserve rights that others don't. Sorry, folks. That's just plain, old-fashioned, anti-Americanism. Plain and simple.